Uh, good afternoon. Great. It's always good to have you as someone who has vast knowledge in this area, in this conversation around COVID-19. Uh, we will discuss the details of the countries where COVID-19 vaccines have been administered across Africa and what kind of uh, vaccines are being administered and the likely benefits of all this to the population among others in a while. Uh, but let me tell you a bit more about Dr. Mike Lowusu very quickly. Um, he's also the executive director of the Center for Health System Strengthening. Uh, it's actually based in um, Kumasi, Ghana. He has over 10 years of experience in both clinical research and biomedical laboratory practice. He holds a PhD in clinical microbiology and is currently supporting the virology team at the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research in Tropical Medicine in Kumasi, Ghana, even as they do all the necessary testing. He's, uh, you know, also uh, the lead scientists, one of the lead scientists supporting the various testing having to do with COVID-19 in Ghana's second biggest city, Kumasi. Doc, once again, thank very much for joining us. Let's just jump quickly into the conversation. Uh, first of all, we know that Africa has to a very large extent been spared of the very dire predictions that we saw that COVID-19 was going to kill millions on the continent because of the very weak infrastructure we have when it comes to the health sector. The continent currently accounts for only about what 4% of the world's about 2.5 million COVID-19 deaths. But what we also know is that the number of deaths have actually been spiking over the last few months. With data we've seen from the African Centers for Disease Control, we are seeing a situation where, for example, as of the 20th of February 2021, um, the COVID-19 deaths, as we had seen it, was hovering around a hundred and you know a hundred thousand with about 3.8 million cases. But the stunning part of it is that between February 2020, when the first case was recorded, and the 22nd of November 2020, the case count stood at about 2 million with about 49,000 deaths. And this means that Africa has recorded as many deaths from COVID-19 in the last three months as we're actually seeing in the first nine months of the breakout of the pandemic. Doc, we should have reason to be worried about these statistics, shouldn't we? Yes, uh, uh, good afternoon to you, uh, good afternoon to all your viewers in, in Ghana, Africa, and across the world. Of course, uh, we should be worried uh, because last year when this outbreak occurred, Ghana had its own in March. I know uh, Nigeria, others ha had their own share. And most of the cases seem to be uh, somewhere around the north of Africa, where Tunisia had, had quite a significant number of people becoming infected. And many people, of course, dying. But I got to a point where we thought that uh, most people were having mild illness, a few deaths. So, the prediction that was made that many Africans uh, were going to die was not really consistent with what was happening on the continent. But we have seen that this year, uh, right after Christmas, a number of African countries are beginning to record surges in cases with deaths. And uh, those of us who are studying this virus believe that uh, the variants which are emerging across different parts of the continent are having their way in Africa. Some of them becoming very virulent, and hopefully some of them are causing deaths. We don't have much data on the kind of strains that are causing deaths on the continent. We are still doing some research, but I believe strongly that the severity of disease caused by these new and emerging variants of this particular SARS-CoV-2 virus could be contributing to the deaths that we are seeing, which is why uh, we have to be worried that things are not just normal, and things seem not to be getting well. And the need for us to increase or step up our interventions and do everything possible to cut down on transmission, to reduce hospitalization, and to reduce, reduce deaths. I mean, this is the best way to deal with virus. And to contain it said that it doesn't stop things from going on, doesn't stop economic activities, uh, to allow many people as possible to go by their normal life and still 
engage with each other as, as we have always lived and as we have always done. So how do we do that? The lockdowns have been lifted, obviously, because people need to get back to their normal lives. In some countries, there have been concerns that COVID-19 uh, tracing and testing has actually gone down over the last few months because everyone is relaxing. So even as we try to get back to normal life across Africa, how do we ensure that we contain the situation so we are not overwhelmed as far as the spread and the deaths are concerned? Well, I mean, if you follow the pattern of this virus, uh, there are two main things that epidemiologists will recommend that you do. The first is, is trying to educate people and offering various interventions, what we call the mitigation measures. So people putting on masks, observing physical distancing, observing social uh, distancing, uh, avoiding large gatherings, funerals, avoiding weddings, and then not going to pubs, beaches, and all that. So many countries have tried to put in these measures in a bit to control infections, but these don't work well. I mean, in Africa, across board, where many people are engaged in informal activities, so uh, you cannot tell them to go to offices. Many are not on government payroll. For you to even say you are, you are, you are, you want to impose lockdown and then give them salaries per month, it, it's quite difficult. And governments don't have funding to feed people and, and to and to provide them with other avenues for them to engage them so that we have to do restrictions. So the mitigation measure is one area that many countries have looked at. Lockdown, many African countries bear witness that lockdown has not really helped because it seemed to create economic problems for many and security problems as well across a, a, a different part that, that try to use this measure. So the few ones that other countries have tried, if you weigh the impact of the lockdown is quite significant. It has devastated many families. Many families have gone into difficult situations. Some have businesses which have collapsed. Some have schools that have not survived even after the economy has opened. And many people in the informal sector are struggling to get back to normal. So lockdown is not an area that you want to recommend for different places in Africa. The mitigation measures seem to be a sure way to do that, but because these mitigation measures will not be enough to crash the virus or what people say to flatten the rapid surges in the virus. Uh, other measures such as the use of vaccine seem to be one of the best ways to help all of us. I mean, if you cannot, if you cannot uh, fully ensure people do what they have to do and you cannot lock down or restrict, then of course you will have to advocate for vaccines for people to take it, as many people as possible to take it to reach the point where you can decide to perhaps uh, go by a normal activity, and just either use the mitigation measures or if possible, I mean, reduce some of these mitigation measures to allow people to go by the normal route. So, mm. I mean, we are, we are fortunate that the vaccines have come in, which for me will help a lot of countries in Africa to, to begin to at least have some breathing space to get things done, get things done. Speaking of the vaccines, at our last check, based on data from Bloomberg, about three days ago, just about 2.66 million doses of vaccines have been administered in Africa, with Morocco leading the pack with about 2.5 million doses, mainly of the Chinese-produced Sinopharm vaccine being administered in a number of other countries like um, uh, Seychelles, as well as South Africa, Egypt, um, vaccinations in those countries have begun as well. And if you look at the global figure, the number of vaccines that's actually been given out has gone beyond even the 210 million mark, with Africa just recording the about 2.6 million, less than 0.2%, although Africa has about one point, uh, you know, about 17% of the global population across the world. Would we ever get to that point when there will be enough vaccines going around to really protect the populace anytime soon before the infections and the deaths get any worse, you think? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful because I know the WHO has been working seriously. I mean, 
somewhere, like from somewhere last year, working with the COVAX team to create a medium through which vaccines can get to underprivileged, low middle income countries and very poor and deprived countries to enable them to have access uh, to this. WHO has also worked very well against national, advising countries not to nationalize uh, vaccines that are produced, but as much as possible to work with, with them and ensure that these are made available as much as possible to many countries. These vaccines come with a cost. And unfortunately, apart from few countries, I think like Egypt, that they um, one Nigeria, one, one of the some few centers that are engaged in some level of uh, phase one or two trial of some of these vaccines. Many African countries don't have capacity to manufacture our own vaccines. Even when they are manufactured, with the funding available to procure and then deploy is, 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 is quite limited. So engage in terms of I mean, having that financial muscle to, 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 to procure or to engage with giant pharmaceutical companies and buy this for ourselves. And this is why through the COVAX medium, we African countries, many countries, we find a kind of environment where we feel that we can also have access to these vaccines to immunize our populations against this, this virus that seems to be bacteria. So the hope is now in the, the, the mother organization of WHO and many other partner organizations across the world uh, to ensure that even as the developed world achieve their target for vaccinating their populations, they will still look back and ensure that they make this my one as much available as much as possible to the African continent. I and mean, there's a statement that the WHO has equally made that I mean we, we never crash this virus until we succeed in protecting everybody. I mean, if you protect one country against it, because of the globalized world, there is always movement of people from one area to the other. So you will expect that uh, people will travel. So if US citizen is protected, you travel to Ghana. So if there are issues of transmission in Ghana, somebody from the US, somebody from UK will still become infected. So it is important that uh, Yeah, so that's um, Dr. Michael Owusu there uh, with um, those uh, responses to uh, questions as we discussed the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Doc, the line was a little uh, thin there, but just to move on to the next point, a, a few days ago, we saw what happened in Ghana, the first batch of vaccines from the COVAX facility that's being run by the World Health Organization and also the Gavi Alliance actually got to Ghana, um, our country, more than 600,000 doses of the uh, COVID-19 vaccines that had been uh, put together in India from uh, Oxford and AstraZeneca. Uh, but just to educate all of us further, uh, what are the different kind of vaccines that are currently available uh, across the world that are being used to deal with the COVID-19 uh, situation uh, as are being distributed across the African continent? Dr. Ozu, if you can hear me, I'm asking that when it comes to the vaccines that are being um, distributed across the continent in order to deal with the COVID-19 situation, uh, we know that there is that which has been developed by Oxford University, there is that by uh, Johnson & Johnson, there is that by Sinopharm in China. Just run us through and make us understand um, the, the, the different kind of vaccines that are being administered uh, across Africa to help deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and tell us more about the characteristics of some of those vaccines. Yes, uh, yeah, th thanks for, for, for this. So there are quite a number of vaccines which have gone through phase three trial which are being deployed on the African continent. So I don't have much full information about what, what perhaps the other countries may be doing for, but I know that the Sinopharm uh, vaccine from China is one of them. 
I know the Russian Sputnik V is, is another, and then the AstraZeneca is one of them. Johnson & Johnson as well, but it's currently being used by South African companies. You know, the different vaccines, of course, are based on different principles. So we have those ones that are using inactivated viruses. So what it means is that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is killed. And then once it is killed, it is, it is used for manufacturing of, of, I mean, of, of the reagents that are of, of a liquid medium, whatever that can be used to inject. And the Sinovac vaccine is an example of an inactivated virus that is going through phase three trial. Some of them also are made up of protein uh, units and others are made up of viral vectors. So for instance, for the viral vectors, for instance, you don't make use of the actual virus. So what they do is that you try to re-engineer a part of the virus in the lab. And we understand that for this particular uh, uh, virus, the head of the virus that we call the spike region, is a region that seems to provoke the most immune response in people. So once the sequence of this region is known, I mean, in the laboratory, uh, the scientists and virologists can reproduce that part of the virus in the lab and then insert it in, in, in another, another medium. So for instance, in the case of AstraZeneca and then in the case of the Russian Sputnik V, that head of the virus, that in the gene that produced the head of the virus is inserted in another virus. The AstraZeneca has what we call the, the chimpanzee or the simian adenovirus which host that part of the gene that produces the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then the Russian virus has two strains of adenovirus, adenovirus 5 and 26, which also hosts the gene that it goes for the head of the virus. So once a human being is administered or takes in that particular uh, I mean, substance, the body recognizes that head that is expressed by this combined vector virus and produces a new response against it and keeps part in memory so that once the person encounters another form of the virus, the person will be able to fight this off. So mostly the, the what we call the recombinant virus is, is one of the viral uh, strategies that seem to work very well. I know the Pfizer and the BioNTech work on the principle of what we call the messenger RNA virus. So in that one, you don't host to another virus, but then the part of the virus that hosts that sequence that expresses the protein is, host, is, is put on a lipid, or a lipid nanoparticle. So once you are injected with it, your body produces that kind of antibody against the part that will be expressed. But because these are messenger RNA virus, they have to be stored at very cold temperatures, which is difficult for many African countries I mean, to go in for. I understand apart from Rwanda, which I think is going for the uh, Pfizer biotech uh, vaccine. I'm not sure how many African countries are doing that because many of us don't have cold temperatures to, to deal with this. There are many others that are still within the trial trial that I believe maybe subsequently we may have to talk about. There are protein-based uh, vaccines, and then there are live attenuated vaccines. Some of them have the virus, which is almost like a weakened form of the virus that is going to use. There are DNA-based vaccines, which are also in development, and then uh, many others. I think that it's quite, uh, maybe in subsequent uh, programs, I may have to do breakdown of of all of them and perhaps discuss what they are doing. But it looks like the vector based ones from AstraZeneca and then also from Russia seem to be the ones that are making the most gains on the African market. That is what many people are using. Do the populace have anything to fear about uh, taking in these vaccines to protect themselves against COVID 19? There are a lot of conspiracy theories that get thrown around about the possible negative effects of taking in some of these vaccines? Well, uh, that is the, the thing, especially on the African continent. Our center has done a study, and so far we have recorded close to 500 responses asking people whether they would like to take this vaccine, and then also finding out from them their fears. And close to 40% of people say, yes, they want to take it, but about 40% of people also say that they are not too sure and they want to obtain further information so they can be convinced. 20% outrightly say they don't want to take it. And if you further ask those who are not too sure, they will either tell you that they are not sure about the safety, some also are, are not too sure about the efficacy. So we have about 40% of people in the population who still are not too much well educated about the vaccines, perhaps about how safe they are, 
and then how efficacious they are as well on the continent. So this is the kind of gaps in information that we have. I mean, the developed world, anybody can read the leaflet on the internet. You can go through a publication, read about how the Russian vaccines were deployed at the phase three, and be convinced that they can work. But within our own African population, where many are in the informal sector and cannot read or write, there is a need for active engagement in the language that they can understand so that they will be able to appreciate what we are doing. And because these vaccines are highly technical, you have to break down the science to the, to the language, uh, to the point where an ordinary person, a market woman, or a, a, uh, somebody who engages in selling, a common trader, can appreciate what we are doing because we are not used to it. Although many children have been vaccinated, uh, the fear that, that, that the vaccine may contain some other agents that will be damaging to the body is still there. So there's a need for us to actively engage especially the rural folks in a language that they can understand so that they can appreciate what is going on. Mm -hmm. And part of the fear has been fueled by other comments made on some networks. If you remember, in France 24 uh, television station, when one uh, France uh, internal medicine physician made a comment that the tuberculosis BCG vaccine could be a cost to serve, uh, to, 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 to vaccinate people uh, and to perhaps reduce COVID-19 cases in Africa where people don't put on masks and people are not treated. So some of these comments also has gone to further reinforce notions of people that if indeed a vaccine is coming, then, then it may have some, some strings attached. So a lot of work is needed for us to still engage the African community, for them to appreciate that once we have bodies like the WHO, which have approved some of these vaccines at the highest level, and you have African CDC, advocating for this and many other organizations moving for this that there is a minimal if possible no risk that anybody will have any bad thing hidden in their mind to wipe away the african continent so we need to still do a lot of work to, uh, to get people to understand and this is the only way to go because if we don't have money to go for lockdowns or to protect lives we may not have money to 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 resource our hospital facilities uh, and to manage some of these people. I mean, some of them are running out of oxygen, for instance. We are not getting them available in some of the hospitals in Africa. So if vaccines are coming, then you are sure that this is what we need so that we can be able to protect ourselves, cut down transmission, and reduce the deaths that are happening. So although some work is done, I think that a lot of the work needs to be done, especially in the informal sector and among the literates. So that they can get, they can buy into what is being given to them, and then support uh, the public health division in rolling out this vaccine. So the education would have to be based on data. You are the expert in the field. There, there are people who've complained about headaches, chills, um, fever, swollen areas after taking some of the COVID nineteen vaccines and all. Are those side effects that are markedly different and worrying that people should actually be concerned about? Of course, uh, in trying to communicate about this vaccine, it's good to let people know the realities and the truth and the fears associated. The vaccines are going to face the trial and have some data available. For instance, we know another close to about 30% will have fever, for instance. We understand that some 4% of people will also have diarrhea, vomiting, and nausea. These are some of the things that come with vaccines, even without SARS-CoV-2 or COVID vaccines. If you take yellow fever vaccines, if you take hepatitis B vaccines, you have the body will have to deal with the foreign body. And therefore, when the body struggles with the foreign body, your body responds by, by, by building a temperature. So your temperature will rise up you heat up a bit, and within about two or three days, you can be fine. So these are minimal side effects that are associated, but it's also good to understand that there are, there's a likelihood of having one or two outliers where people may have some severe adverse drug events that may come along with this. But fortunately for us, this may form a small subset of the population that we need to watch out for. For instance, in Ghana, for instance, I mean, the vaccines are not just being rolled out. But the FDA and the Ghana Health Service are also interested in doing what we call an enhanced pharmacovigilance. What it means is that everyone that takes the vaccine will be tracked. So 
on a weekly basis, I guess information will be collected from people how they feel, whether they have headache, whether they are, have vomiting, whether they have diarrhea. And then these data that they collect, you feed it to the national system. And if possible, you have clinicians that will attend to these people as and when these side effects come out and as and when some of this happen. And I also understand that efficacy data will also be collected for us to have our own understanding of how well these vaccines will do and perform on the African continent. So yes, it is a vaccine in mass vaccination, but it is being given within the context of a trial of a sort, so that it is not just being given blindly, but then there is the active work for us to have as much information as possible to be able to get records and raw data on what is happening to further inform population. So the, the truth will have been told to all of us that yes, vaccines may come with some minimal side effects, which may not be harmful. I mean, may not be death, it may be something that is manageable. But it's important that we still deal with it and manage it so that we'll be able to protect the populace. Doc, I know you need to jump into another meeting um, right now, but just to quickly run through um, one uh, final question um, that I have, which you, you, you could kindly help us address. We, we, we know that, um, for example, when it comes to the availability of the vaccines, the developed world have uh, made their choices and uh, there's the complaint about a lot of countries like the UK um, and other nations ordering for excess vaccines that they don't need. Canada, well, at least for now, um, Canada uh, ordering more than 156 million full vaccines in excess of what they need currently. Um, the European Union doing more than 525 million full vaccine doses than they need right now in terms of them over ordering. Um, in, in terms of the availability for it to get to other parts of the world, not necessarily they didn't invest in helping produce it. Is there an issue about intellectual property and is there really a way that could be dealt with so that then um, more people are vaccinated in Africa where the population is huge, but for example, contributes to just about 0.2% of available doses of COVID-19 currently. Yes, I, I, you, 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 you're making some very important points. And what is what I believe the World Health Organization has been trying to deal with at the highest level to, to ensure that there is fairness and equity in distribution of, of these vaccines across the world. And, and that is some of, because the companies that of course uh, manufactured this, most of, most of these are in the developed world. In the US, in the UK, with some form of intellectual property they are holding. You cannot just go about and even resynthesize or, or manufacture and distribute without having permit and agreement with this uh, company that developed it. And, it. and it also, I mean, the point is that once these companies are in these developed countries, we will expect that uh, other European partners will have an upper hand in trying to engage and to have more of this compared to those of us who are in Africa. And you can't take this away from the company because these are uh, companies that have investment, some of them from the public sector of their own countries, others through private partnership. And once they have made such an investment, you will expect them to be able to at least go, go in a way that will not uh, make them run out of uh, funds or make them recoup the kind of investment they have made. But this is where you also need the world bodies, I mean, uh, various uh, developed partners at the highest level to be able to make decisions so that if we have to have donor funding coming in from various international bodies, this has to be done as soon as possible to be able to procure and negotiate for these vaccines at the highest level and make it available to all developing countries. So I know uh, the COVAX, including the Gavi Alliance and other well-meaning uh, bodies across the world, which have been supporting vaccines in developing countries for so many years, are still working behind the scene to ensure that countries in Africa are not left behind. Mm -hmm. I mean, for those who study viruses, we understand that if you study the people that a vaccine can protect individuals when they are given two doses, and you give just one dose, uh, what you may do is to encourage mutant strains of the virus to re-emerge. It's something that you wouldn't want to see in, in countries that don't have the capacity to procure. So for instance, if African countries are able to procure, let's say 100,000 doses for everybody, 
expecting that within two or three months we have the second dose and we struggle on getting these second doses, then there will be no work done because just the first dose will not be able to protect. And this, as these delays, we may end to a phase where we may have the same strains that the vaccines can be efficacious against now we imagine to become other forms that these vaccines now will not be able to manage. So there's a need for this to be done urgently and as soon as possible to ensure that enough vaccines are available as much as possible for the various populations. That once you start, you are able to go through your two doses and vaccinate as many as possible to achieve herd immunity in code so that the economy can be open fully for people to go by their normal duties. In, in, in the light of that, does it make strategic sense that we are investing in vaccines that require two doses, like the Oxford um, AstraZeneca one, when there is, for example, the Johnson & Johnson one, which is available, shouldn't more focus be placed on that, which is just a single shot, at least from what we are being told on uh, th th that far, instead of focusing on those that require a more complicated way of administering the, 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 the vaccines? A lot of factors come in when you want to go for vaccine. Cost is, is one of the issues you want to look at. And once again, apart from costs about availability on the market, your bargaining power, for instance, we are fortunate that the vaccines which are being given in some other African countries are being given through the COVAX region, which has made it quite charitable for us to have easy access to the AstraZeneca vaccines. So I'm sure that left to every country, we want to go for one single dose, which makes it easier uh, rather than the two dose, which may people may be reluctant or maybe forget to go for their second doses that they complicate their problem. But if you are an emergency and a pandemic like what we have, whatever you get, you make you make good use of it because you don't want to wait. If you want to wait for Johnson and Johnson and you are told that it will come in the next three months' time, you wait for your people to die, then you are better off at least giving your people what is available. And if Johnson and Johnson comes, you can have a section of the public that can equally receive this. So in Ghana, for instance, the government is hoping to receive vaccines from different companies as and when the food drug board approves of it. So you can have two or three vaccines being given at different times. Some may come maybe a single dose, others are double dose, so that you don't deprive the people from getting access. Access is very important, and what is available is what the countries will go in for. And, and I think that this is what is limiting many countries from getting in what in quotes will be the best for them. I mean, if you know what is the best for you, but you don't have logistics and funding to procure, then you are better off working with what is available so that you can use that to protect your population. Those who raise concerns with Russia's uh, Sputnik vaccine and um, uh, China's Sinopharm vaccines and said that it's not gone through very transparent processes as the others like Moderna and uh, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson have gone through. Do you, do you think those fears are founded under any circumstance at all? Well, I, I don't think those fears are founded, especially when the Russian Sputnik V vaccine has been published in a highly reputable journal like Lancet, where every available details of this vaccine is open to the public. I mean, I am a scientist myself. I have read every detail of the publication and I've read their methods. I'm very convinced that the methods they use in undertaking their phase two trial is scientifically sound. So once you have a country which has gone through phase three with sound, uh, I mean, sounds epidemiological study conducted in a world rigorous manner. It means that the finding that they have is quite acceptable and applicable to the populations. This is what convinces some of us that indeed it is good that we go for it. Initially, when this had not been published, there was skepticism across the scientific world that we don't know what they have done. But just like AstraZeneca has published their findings in a reputable journal, similarly, the Russians have equally done that, and every detail of it is available. And this is why I don't think that there's a cost for any country to be afraid. And the principle of open access and availability of data and information is what these journals use in accessing what every country does and publishes. So I, I'm not too sure that we may have to go by that. And you know, also in the political world, you will expect that if items come from Russia and China and Europe and the US, they are likely to be competing powers in trying to say that one may be good and one may not be good. But for me, once the principle of the science is satisfactory and they go through rigorous process in undertaking their trial, and such information is not hidden, 
but is made available to the public for every scientist to assess for themselves and to understand what is behind it. It makes it quite convincing and comfortable for you to be deployed in various countries. So I don't think we have to go by that. It is best to tell countries to, to, to bring out information that is available on their vaccines than telling countries not to do that because Telling Canada to do that would mean they have to nationalize their vaccines. And if every country decides to really treat their population, then where do we go? AstraZeneca may not be able to supply the entire world. Pfizer may not be able to meet the needs of the everybody. So we want different countries to support, like we have always done, in order to meet the growing demands across the world. And this has to be done within a short period so that we don't allow the, the virus to go through its own cycle and mutate and become something that will make all the gains that we have have now slow down or maybe roll back. Okay, final words. I would want to hear a message to governments. I would want to hear a message to ordinary members of the public and probably uh, the international community as well separately. Well, uh, for, for African countries, what we want to still tell them is that the vaccines is one of the surest way of protecting lives against very small nanoparticles like viruses. There is no better way of managing viruses and getting it out of countries just with drugs. We need vaccine to deal with it. And once vaccines have come, we need to embrace these vaccines, educate our populations, and talk to them in a language that they can understand so that they will embrace this and help us to get this out of the country. So Africans have a lot of work to do in trying to engage ordinary people to appreciate the importance of this for their youth. I mean, for the international company, uh, uh, international countries and various uh, bodies, uh, including other uh, companies that are well resourced, what we also want to tell them that protecting life in any developed country will not be enough to make the world safe. So because we are in a globalized village and people may inter travel and may intermix and they may move from one place to the other, so there is a need for all of us, as, as, as everybody, to ensure that these vaccines are deployed to the remote areas, to poor and the privileged and, and, and resource constrained areas, so that everyone will have access and everybody will be protected, so that this virus can get out of the world once and for all. We shouldn't get to a point where you have the virus not in Europe, but separated in Africa, or even within Africa, some countries are experiencing spikes and outbreaks. That is not what we need for the world. And therefore, we have to reach a point where everyone has the benefit of having equitable access to these vaccines to use on their populations and to ensure that every single life is protected. The life that we protect in Africa is important as the life that we protect in Europe and also in Asia. As, as you spoke of the importance of vaccines and the, the advice to government and all, I read something two days ago about the government in Tanzania making the point that they have the virus situation very much under control. They've been able to come up with suggestions on how to uh, get it cured when infection happens. And they think the numbers are not that huge. So they are not very much interested in participating in any processes that would lead to a rollout of a vaccination program in that country. And the government spokesperson made that point in a BBC interview. Could there ever be a basis for such a positioning in dealing with a global pandemic like this? Well, there is no basis for this. And it's quite unfortunate that we have countries with leaders who want to go along this path. Tanzania is one of the countries that uh, is, the FDA is well recognized as performing very well at the highest level of uh, maturity three. Uh, they, they have a maturity level three. Uh, well recognized internationally when it comes to managing and handling drugs. So I wouldn't expect a country like that to, to begin to spearhead this agenda. There's a difference between vaccines and drugs. Drugs work against viruses by destroying and curing them. Vaccines work in preventing people from becoming infected. And even if, if they are infected, it reduces severity of disease and possible deaths that drugs alone cannot do. Many drugs are on the market, but each and every second, viruses are able to undergo various mutations that makes these drugs even difficult to work with. So in Africa, for instance, we have defeated things like polio because of vaccines. And we have defeated and crushed things like measles because of vaccines. Mumps, measles, rubella are almost off because of vaccines. 
if you look at bacteria, things like pneumococcal meningitis is almost off because of vaccines. Water viruses have almost getting out because of Rotary's vaccine. So this is not the first time we are taking this. And, and our, our continence has become better. Deaths have reduced about under five years because of vaccines. So vaccines have gone a long way to help make our lives better for so many years. Without vaccines, I wouldn't know what we do as a continent. Yellow fever is almost extinguished because of vaccines. So it does not really help for countries to say that they have drugs available and therefore they would not want to go for vaccines. What it means is that if you don't do that, you have the virus lurking around in, in the country and this will be there for a long period of time. And, and the danger that the citizens of these countries could pose to other countries when they travel to them could also be quite high. So I would urge governments in, in Tanzania, for instance, to reconsider their decisions and to have a clear distinction between vaccines and drugs. They can go ahead to develop their drugs, but then they have to still ensure that vaccines are deployed so that we'll be able to get these viruses and bacteria out of the system and make life better for the entire population. Many thanks for making the time to speak to us on the Cornell Alliance for Science platform this afternoon, Dr. Michael Owusu, who is a virologist and a lecturer at the Department of Medical Diagnostics at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He's also with the Kumasi Center for Collaborative uh, research into tropical diseases. Uh, they've been doing a lot of work when it comes to research and even testing of COVID cases. And Dr. Uzu has been doing a lot of uh, public education and he's been offering vast amounts of that over the last 45 minutes or so on this conversation that we've been having. Doc, thanks very much for joining us. For those of you who are watching, we would have more of these coming up in the days ahead, even as we discuss all the issues having to do with COVID-19 and other science topics. You can connect with us at Science Ally on Facebook. You can connect with us on Instagram at um, Science Ally as well, and also at Eat Modified. You can get onto our YouTube page and look for us at Science Ally, even as you follow all the various conversations we are having about science-based topics and also about COVID-19 and issues of vaccines and all. Many thanks. We'll bring you another edition in the days ahead. But for now, good afternoon to all of us in Africa and a very good morning to all the audiences in the United States of America. And Dr. Wusu, once again, thank you very much for making the time to join us. Welcome. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.